Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Good evening again. I'm Terry Groover with the Public Involvement Team. Thank you for joining us for this Bus Rapid Transit Program virtual public meeting. Participants are joining us via their computers on WebEx or through their phones and are currently muted. I'll describe the meeting format and how to participate in just a moment. But first, if you're having any technical issues right now, you may need to hang up or log off, then redial or reconnect. If that doesn't work, please contact WebEx Help at 866-229-3239. The number showing on your screen, and again, it's 866-229-3239. We're looking forward to your comments and questions this evening, and after the presentation, we'll describe and display instructions for asking a question or making a comment. Keep in mind that after this meeting, you can continue to provide feedback by taking our survey anytime through December 18th on the BRT program webpage at phoenix.gov slash BRT. That's also shown on the screen, phoenix.gov slash BRT. Please note that this event is being recorded and will also be posted to that webpage. With me this evening is Sarah Kotecki, the City of Phoenix Bus Rapid Transit Program Administrator, along with our Consultant Project Manager, Matthew Taunton. Sarah and Matthew will be giving us a presentation on the Bus Rapid Transit Program and answering questions after the presentation. Now I'll pass it over to Sarah Kotecki. Thank you for the introductions, Terry, and welcome to the virtual public meeting for the Phoenix Bus Rapid Transit Program. A lot of information will be shared today, but there are three things that we want you to take away from this presentation. First, we have a commitment to Phoenix residents to deliver bus rapid transit, also known as BRT. Secondly, we have six strong potential BRT corridors that we will be discussing. And finally, the Phoenix BRT program is in the public education and outreach phase. So in 2015, Phoenix voters approved Proposition 104, creating the 35-year street and transit plan known as Transportation 2050 or T2050. And a primary objective of T2050 is to provide transportation solutions, considering a future growth of an additional six to 700,000 residents in the city of Phoenix. And for our city to be economically viable with that kind of growth, a higher percentage of people will need to utilize transit. Fortunately, transit is the most space efficient way of moving lots of people. And BRT was identified as a component of T2050 to expand our high capacity transit network, which means Phoenix has a commitment to you to deliver bus rapid transit. The question is, how are we going to execute this? And one of the first steps is to identify corridors that will create or form our foundation network. So BRT has been around for over 45 years, implemented in over 160 cities worldwide, including US cities such as Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, and most recently Houston, Texas. So BRT is different than the rapid and express service that you may be familiar with. So BRT serves major roadways for all users operating on a 12 hour daily peak. Their frequency will be every 10 minutes and the stops will be approximately every one mile. Also BRT buses have a higher passenger capacity. Compared to rapid and express buses, they service the park and ride locations typically uh, utilizing the freeways to go from the park and rides to the downtown core. Uh, the users are specifically for the commuter traffic during that traditional AM and PM rush hour. The frequencies, depending on the route, is every 10 to 30 minutes. Also, they have very few stops in comparison to the bus rapid transit, and also their bus capacity for the rapid and express buses is lower than that of a BRT bus. So BRT is a high capacity bus service that focuses on improved speed, reliability, convenience, and the overall transit experience. So there are no universal standards for BRT and the upside to that is it can be planned and designed to best meet the needs of a specific community. And BRT has the opportunity to provide people with faster connections to key destinations such as job centers, 
healthcare facilities, schools, and shops. And there are common recurring elements found in successful BRT systems, and we will talk about those. But keep in mind that the more elements that are incorporated into a system, the more robust the system will be, and the more likely it is to succeed as in an effective, efficient transportation service. So the first element we'll talk about is enhanced stations. This could include center or side stations. We would have wider platforms, level boarding, making it easier for people of all abilities to efficiently access the bus, large canopies or shelters to provide shade, seating and leaning rails, real-time information, letting people know when the next bus will be arriving, and also ticket vending machines. Another element um, is custom buses. So custom buses, buses would have low floors for that level platform boarding. Typically they are 60 foot articulated buses. So they have that higher passenger capacity, somewhere in the 100 to 125 passengers. Multiple doors for faster entry and exit. Uh, we would have amenities such as USB chargers and also the ability to have bicycles on board the bus. Advanced fare collection is when a transit rider pays before uh, riding the bus or boarding the bus. And we would uh, do that with a mobile fare payment on your phone, reloadable smart cards, or ticket validators. Unique branding would differentiate this mode from other modes, such as the rapid. And there are two primary components in branding. You'd have the nomenclature, which is the brand name, and then the visual aspect, which is the logo and the color scheme. And eventually the city of Phoenix will be engaging the public in online polls and contests to get people excited about this new uh, transit service that's coming to the city. There's also the potential for dedicated lanes and dedicated lanes separate buses from vehicular traffic, which helps increase the speed and reliability of a system. And they can be implemented for a portion of the corridor for the entire alignment. They can also be time specific where a bus would utilize a lane during certain hours of the day. And the city will evaluate the appropriateness of dedicated lanes based on existing right of way. And there are areas in the city where dedicated lanes would have minimal impact due to excess right of way. The last two elements that I'll be discussing are transit spot improvements, and these are tools to improve transit operations. The first one, uh, they're called Q jump lanes, and they consist of an additional lane at an intersection, allowing buses to merge smoothly back into the regular through lanes past the stopped vehicles. So it essentially gives buses a head start. The other transit spot improvement is called transit signal priority, and this modifies the normal signal operation process to better accommodate buses. So we can extend the green time, we could shorten the red time, Transit signal priority also helps with saving fuel and contributes toward fewer delays. So the City of Phoenix uh, Council and the Citizens Transportation Commission directed the city to reevaluate the initial corridors identified on the Prop 104 ballot and also asked us to identify other potential corridors for consideration. So this is a data-driven process, and we took a three-prong approach. We looked at transit propensity, which is demographic and socioeconomic data. We looked at transit performance, which is uh, specifically ridership. And we also looked at a forecasting model. And based on those, those three factors, this map shows the revised BRT, potential BRT corridors that rose to the top. So to get uh, your bearings, the dark gray line on the map represents the existing light rail alignment. The gray cross hatching represents the future light rail alignment. And the eight locations that rose to the top for the east west, starting at the north, is Camelback Road, Indian School Road, Thomas Road, Van Buren, or excuse me, McDowell, and then Van Buren. The north-south corridors starting on the east is 24th Street, 19th Avenue, and then 35th Avenue. So again, these eight locations rose to the top based on that transit performance, transit propensity, and the forecasting model. And keep in mind that when I talk about a corridor, it could mean two streets coupled together. 
So this program is brand new to the city of Phoenix, and we are starting out with a clean slate. And our ultimate goal is to identify our foundation network, which will consist of three corridors. And think of it this way, this network will expand and extend to the outer reaches of the city over time. So even though you don't see corridors on this map, south of Van Buren or north of Peoria Avenue. As the city of Phoenix grows, there is more demand. The system will build out and the network will grow accordingly. Our focus for the foundation network were on those corridors that would be the most productive and that had the highest need and the highest demand. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matthew, who will talk about transit performance, propensity and ridership. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, good evening, everyone. So, as Sarah mentioned, we're going to talk a little more detail about the transit performance, propensity, and ridership, both for local bus and uh, the potential BRT corridors. Uh, but before we dive in, just want to let you know that all the maps and information that we're showing, it's available on the Phoenix BRT website, which again is uh, phoenix.gov slash BRT. Again, that's phoenix.gov slash BRT. So let's start with kind of a Phoenix bus service uh, 101. Um, many of you might be aware, but Phoenix is by far the dominant transit provider in the region. Over two thirds of all transit boardings in the Valley occur in the city of Phoenix. And the city of Phoenix and the Valley as a whole, we have a grid network that many transit systems aspire to, but traveling across the grid, particularly in a diagonal direction, uh, could be improved because it's heavily reliant on rider transfers. The other issue is the current bus network we has plateaued in some corridors. So for example, we have routes in central Phoenix that have frequencies of 10 minutes or less in the peak hour. Now we could add additional frequency to those routes, but they'll probably uh, be diminishing returns unless it's packaged with some sort of transit infrastructure investment. So really our challenge in Phoenix is how do we improve uh, transit speed and reliability to better meet unmet transit demand. So how do some of the potential BRT corridors compare to other successful BRT projects? Now, uh, this chart, it shows BRT projects from Kansas City, Minneapolis, and Seattle. And the green lines on the chart, that shows the local bus ridership in the corridor before BRT. And then the orange lines, that shows the corresponding increase in ridership once BRT was implemented. And as you can see, there was a substantial increase in ridership in each of these corridors when BRT was implemented. So now let's compare these uh, BRT projects. Uh, you can just advance the slide. Thank you. Uh, now let's compare these uh, BRT projects to some of the higher performing local bus corridors in Phoenix. And what you'll see is many of these local bus corridors in Phoenix, uh, the ridership for that already exceeds that of these other successful BRT projects. And that means there's great potential for BRT ridership in Phoenix. So transit ridership in this region, it's most often reported at the route level and the transit performance metrics that are most often used are what's called average daily boardings and boardings per revenue mile. Now we inventoried every bus route within the city of Phoenix and this map shows the routes that have the highest combined average daily ridership and boardings per revenue mile. So while that ridership in this region is most often uh, reported at the route level, what we're really interested in is where people are boarding along the routes. Now you can imagine how many bus stops there are in the city of Phoenix. So what we've done here is we've uh, compiled all that boardings by bus stop data into one mile arterial segments. And those segments in green on the map, those are the segments that have the highest local bus ridership in Phoenix. And there's some uh, common trends among these. Uh, these segments are typically on the routes that have the highest frequency, and these routes oftentimes connect with uh, light rail or other frequent uh, bus service. So this next map, this shows transit propensity, which Sarah mentioned, these are the demographic and socioeconomic indicators of potential transit performance and demand. And this includes things like population density, employment density, uh, low income households, and so on. And we have individual maps for all these categories, but what is shown here is a composite overlay of all these categories together. Now, the darker the color or shading, that indicates the higher intensity or density of these categories. 
And it's these areas specifically that have the highest potential for transit demand. So now if you overlay that ridership by segment map I showed you earlier with the composite transit propensity map shown on the last slide, you'll see that most of the highest ridership segments in Phoenix overlay with the areas of the highest transit propensity. And this is a good thing because this shows that the uh, current local bus network in Phoenix is serving the areas that have the highest potential transit demand. So using uh, this transit propensity and performance data, we ident identified the eight BRT corridors shown on the map. And these are the same uh, corridors that Sarah reviewed with you earlier. Uh, we then prepared detailed ridership forecasts for each of these corridors. And we presented the results of this information at a technical workshop that was attended by City of Phoenix staff and departments of Valley Metro, the Maricopa Association of Governments, or MAG, and ADOT. The next step was we then optimized the BRT corridors based on feedback at that technical workshop. And we did so so the BRT corridors function more like actual bus routes. You know, they had things like logical endpoints such as uh, transit centers. We also combined several of the BRT corridors together to improve connection and then minimize uh, rider transfers. And this resulted in the six uh, BRT corridors that are shown on the map. And we'll go through each of these corridors on the subsequent slides. And for each of these, we list the uh, corridor endpoints, the corridor distance, and the corresponding ridership forecast. So the first corridor shown, this is Camelback and 24th Street. Uh, this corridor starts at the Desert Sky Transit Center, then travels north on 75th Avenue to Camelback, east on Camelback to 24th Street, then south on 24th Street, where it terminates at the future SkyTrain station at 24th Street and Buckeye that's under construction. And it should be noted, this corridor shares a border with the city of Glendale on Camelback Road, west of 43rd Avenue. Our next corridor is Indian School and 24th Street. Uh, this corridor also starts at the Desert Sky Transit Center, travels north on 75th Avenue to Indian School, east on Indian School to 24th Street, and then south on 24th Street to that future SkyTrain station at 24th Street and Buckeye. Our third corridor, this is Thomas and 44th Street. It also starts at the Desert Sky Transit Center, but it travels directly east on Thomas across the city of Phoenix to 44th Street, where it turns south on 44th Street and terminates at the existing SkyTrain station at 44th Street and Washington. There's also a light rail station at that location. Our fourth corridor, this is a McDowell and 44th Street. And this corridor is much shorter than some of the other corridors because it starts at 35th Avenue instead of the Desert Sky Transit Center. And it does so because this is the location where it would overlap with the future Capital I-10 West light rail extension. And as Sarah mentioned earlier, that gray cross hatching on the map that shows those future light rail extensions in the city of Phoenix. But this corridor, it starts at 35th Avenue and McDowell travels east on McDowell to 44th Street, then south on 44th Street to the existing uh, SkyTrain station at 44th Street in Washington. Our fifth corridor, and this is 35th Avenue and Van Buren. Uh, this corridor starts at the Metro Center Transit Center, then it travels south on 35th Avenue to Van Buren, then east on Van Buren to downtown Phoenix, and this uh, corridor, it also includes a sub option, and those are shown in dashed lines, which uses 19th Avenue instead of 35th Avenue south of Camelback. And our sixth and final corridor, this is 19th Avenue in Van Buren. And this corridor starts at the Sunny Slope Transit Center, then it travels south on 19th Avenue to Van Buren, and then east on Van Buren to downtown Phoenix. Now the segment that's on uh, 19th Avenue North Montebello, that overlaps with the existing light rail line and therefore is shown as a sub option in the dashed red line. So the ultimate goal, as I mentioned, is to select uh, BRT corridors that form our BRT foundation network. So what makes a good BRT network scenario? In general, there are a few best practices and I'll kind of go over them now. Um, in general, we want good geographic coverage and spacing, and that typically means a minimum of two miles spacing between corridors. 
We also want the BRT corridors to ideally intersect with other BRT corridors, and we want to connect to light rail and as much uh, frequent local bus service as possible. And finally, we want termini or endpoints that are also logical, logical origins and destinations, you know, places like transit centers. So based on that, what are some of the potential BRT network scenarios? So we've uh, developed four potential scenarios using those best practices that I just described on the previous slide, and we'll toggle through them here. Uh, we also have a slide that shows all four side by side. Um, so our first BRT network scenario that's shown here is Camelback 24th Street, Thomas 44th Street, and 35th Avenue Van Buren. Our second network scenario is Camelback 24th Street, Thomas 44th Street, and 19th Avenue Van Buren. Our third scenario, this is Indian School 24th Street, McDowell 44th Street, and 35th Avenue Van Buren. And you can kind of see a trend here. And then our fourth and final scenario, this is Indian School 24th Street, McDowell 44th Street, and 19th Avenue Van Buren. Van Buren. So as I mentioned, this uh, slide shows a comparison of all four BRT network scenarios side by side. And you can see that they each have slightly different uh, geographic coverage and transit connections. And the purpose of this is we show these BRT network scenarios to provide further context for each of the potential six BRT corridors. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to Sarah to close out the presentation. Thanks, Matthew. So we have a fantastic opportunity in front of us. We are working towards bringing BRT to the fifth largest city in the U.S. The BRT program, as I mentioned earlier, is in the middle of the public education and outreach phase. Uh, we have, once, once this completes uh, through the end of this calendar year, uh, we're going to go back to the Citizens Transportation Commission and the City Council with a staff recommendation for the potential uh, network foundation. And we have a web page, phoenix.gov slash BRT. We have a lot of great information on that web page. We have a BRT 101 video, a fact sheet, frequently asked questions and answers, upcoming meeting information. We also have a link to a virtual presentation, essentially the presentation that we're giving you uh, this evening and our survey. And the survey is really important. We ask that everybody, if you haven't done so already, please take a moment and go to phoenix.gov slash BRT. Take the survey because this feedback, we want to hear from you. The feedback that we gather from the survey will help us form our staff recommendation moving forward. So again, that's phoenix.gov slash BRT. And I'd like to thank everybody for your time. And I'm going to turn it back over to Terry to start the question and answer portion of the meeting. Great. Thanks so much, Sarah. So, um, if you, as Sarah mentioned, uh, the, the website will be accepting comments anytime. So, if you don't have a chance to get your comment in this evening or you're not able to stay with us for the rest of the meeting, please uh, go to the website and provide um, comments to us. We are very interested in, in hearing your thoughts. So, uh, as we begin the question and answer portion of the meeting, if you are using WebEx, you can raise your hand to verbally ask a question, or you can use the Q&A function to type in a question or comment. The project team will answer your questions either way that you submit them. Uh, all of these WebEx instructions are showing on your screen. If you're joining by phone, uh, it's a little bit easier. You could just need to press star three if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment. And this gives us a hand raise signal. And when it's your turn to speak, we'll call on you. Your line will be unmuted and you'll hear that. And when you're finished speaking, we just ask that you press star three again to remove the hand raise signal so that, um, so that we know that we have addressed your question. Uh, again, those uh, instructions are showing on the screen. And we will go through the questions and comments in the order in which they're received. If we have any outstanding questions or comments, excuse me one second, if we have any that are outstanding that um, we're not able to get to, um, you can use, we will uh, post those, I'm sorry, at the end of the meeting, we'll post them along with the responses in the public meeting summary. That will be um, emailed to meeting participants and available on the website. Again, this is being recorded, and so the recording is also available on the website as well as a transcript of the Q&A. 
So a couple of reminders, if you're having technical issues, contact WebEx help. You'll see that phone number. It's listed up there on the top right hand corner of the screen. The number if you're calling in is 866-229-3239. Um, so Christy Shepard with our public involvement team is managing the questions queue. Um, I know that we do have a couple of questions that have already come in. So Christy, are we ready to begin? Yes, we are ready. Um, so let's go ahead and start with our hand raised. Ryan Boyd, I see that your hand is raised. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute your line and you now have the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much. Uh, my name's Ryan Boyd. I live in uh, the Oakland neighborhood just off of downtown Phoenix, and I also serve with the Urban Phoenix Project. And my, I have two questions real quick. One is uh, I've heard that South Phoenix has a lot of uh, high transit use, use. It seems weird to me that we don't have any BRT lines within South Phoenix. And then the second question is, uh, I know there's lots of conversations about uh, different characteristics of bus rapid transit. Uh, I particularly noted that there's organizations like Institute for Transportation and Development Policy that list a lot of the ones you said as pretty much requirements for bus rapid transit. Are there any of those characteristics that are for sure going to be included within the City of Phoenix's plan? Thank you. Thanks, Ryan, for the question. Um, we appreciate that. Uh, I'll kind of answer these in order. So the, the first question, was about uh, BRT and whether or not any lines have been considered in South Phoenix. Um, so just to kind of recap the process that we followed, our entire analysis was based on uh, two things. One, it was a uh, detailed look at existing uh, transit uh, performance and propensity in the city of Phoenix. And then we also looked at uh, forecasted ridership. And kind of, if you recall that summary map I showed that uh, showed ridership by segment, we really tried to focus on the segments that have the highest performing ridership in the city today. And it just turns out that most of those uh, segments are more centrally located. But we did inventory every segment within South Phoenix and the city as a whole. Um, I do think there are a couple other factors worth considering. Um, obviously, the familiar, I'm sure, with the South Central uh, light rail extension that will take light rail south to baseline. Um, similar to what we saw when uh, the Northwest Extension light rail opened, it had a profound effect on how uh, local bus service functioned. Uh, typically, there's kind of a draw factor to light rail, and so we would anticipate when South Central opens that maybe many of those uh, east-west routes, such as you know Southern or Broadway and so on, may uh, see an increase in corresponding ridership. So it's not to say that uh, BRT couldn't be uh, considered in that area in the future. It just, based off the current metrics we uh, looked at now, it didn't rate as highly. Um, but the other thing to mention is that both the north-south corridors that, or excuse me, all of the north-south corridors that are being considered, they all could be extended further south in the future. There's nothing physically that would pr uh, preclude extending BRT um, farther south in the future. Um, the second question was about um, you know, the characteristics and the requirements of BRT, maybe what City of Phoenix is looking at versus what are sort of the national or international standards. And as Sarah mentioned, there is no universal standard for uh, BRT, and that's one of the things that makes it really attractive because it can be uh, designed to best meet the needs of the community. And in this case, we're trying to right size it according to Phoenix. I do think there are some common elements that are a given, and I'll kind of go over those. So one would be we anticipate that we would have uh, larger vehicles. So at a minimum, we'd have 60 foot articulated buses in the corridor. And we'd assume that those uh, buses themselves would have uh, three doors to facilitate, uh, facilitate kind of that rapid porting. We also um, assume that we're gonna have a uh, off-board fare collection of some sort using this new uh, regional fare collection system that the city of Phoenix is uh, developing. And then we think a lot of the other standard suite of improvements, things like uh, level platform boardings or other transit speed and reliability improvements such as um, queue jump lanes or uh, transit signal priority are all, I think, pretty much a given. The, the main factor would be the potential for dedicated lanes. Um, Phoenix has a very different cross-section depending where you are within the roadway, and the primary, um, I guess, delay that transit vehicles um, experience today is that delay that occurs at intersections. So the, the treatment to improve it isn't universal, 
but we're gonna be trying to uh, basically add those transit uh, spot improvements at the locations that warrant them. Thanks, Matthew. We did have another question that came through um, during the presentation. The local route underlies the BRT route in each corridor, correct? That is correct. Yeah, so um, the, the policy that we're following is similar to what was done for light rail. So if you're you know, familiar with light rail as it operates on Central Avenue, there's you know, light rail that operates in the center of the roadway, and then you also have the route zero, which is sort of what we call the underlying service that operates with kind of a shorter stop spacing, spacing you know, every quarter mile or so. We're taking the same approach for BRT. So if you were to take any of these corridors, let's pick uh, 35th Avenue. So if BRT is implemented on 35th Avenue, it would likely have that longer stop spacing, maybe stops every you know, one mile or in certain locations, half mile. But the Route 35, the underlying service, it wouldn't go away. It just likely would operate with uh, less frequency in the future. And sort of the, the standard, there's no formal policy, but the, the general standard that this region follows is that underlying service would be you know, roughly every 30 minutes and serve those quarter mile stops. Whereas the BRT, which is the overlay service, would be much more frequent you know, every 10 minutes and then serve the, the longer distance stops like every one mile. Thank you, Matthew. Christy, do we have any other calls coming in? Any other hands raised? It doesn't look like we have any other hand raised at this time. Okay, just a reminder, um, the instructions that are listed there for raising your hand um, via WebEx and also if you're on the phone, and we can toggle back and forth between those instructions so you can you can take a look and see how to um, submit a question or a comment. And again, through the website anytime, phoenix.gov slash BRT. Uh, while we wait for any additional questions or comments, um, let's just go through a couple of other um, kind of interesting uh, questions about BRT. Uh, Matthew, maybe you could describe some, uh, go over the typical elements of BRT. I know you've mentioned a little bit of that in your presentation, but maybe just give us some highlights there. Sure. sure. Yeah. So the uh, typical elements that are included in BRT are, again, uh, we oftentimes um, talk about the stations themselves. So these would be stations you know, more and similar to a light rail station than a local bus stop, meaning that they would have sort of enhanced amenities. Um, they'd have a raised platform for level boarding. Um, we would also have custom buses. Again, I mentioned kind of that 60 foot articulated bus. Uh, everything about the bus we set up to kind of facilitate that rapid kind of ons and offs. Um, we would also have the uh, fare collection system that I mentioned, offboard fare payment, mobile pay payment, validators, things like that. Um, you pay, you know, be very similar to light rail where you pay before you get on board. And then we'd have those transit speed and reliability improvements that Sarah mentioned, things like uh, queue jumps and uh, transit signal priority. And then finally, we'd also have uh, the potential for dedicated lanes. You know, there's a lot of areas within the corridors today where there is excess right away. And then there are other areas where it might be a challenge at an intersection um, to figure out a way to improve the transit speed and reliability. So it's just, it's really gonna vary where along the alignment specifically. Those are kind of the high level. Thanks, Matthew. Um, also a reminder, if you're calling in, you just press the star three and that will give us a hand raise signal. And we'll call on you and your phone will be unmuted. You can ask your question. Then when you finish, uh, you can press star three again and that'll remove the hand raise signal. Any other questions, Christy? Uh, nope, we don't have any additional questions at this time. Okay, well, let's put Matthew back to work here. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see, how about, um, if you could just describe, uh, reiterate the benefits of BRT, and I, maybe Sarah wants to jump in on this one as well. Sure, I can take that one, Terry. So there are many benefits of BRT for a fast growing city like Phoenix. Uh, they include faster and more frequent service. So BRT is often 20 to 25% faster than local bus service. Uh, increased cost efficiency, 
BRT can reduce operating costs by stopping less often, thus increasing the travel speed of the vehicle. Uh, this reduces the number of vehicles needed to adhere to headways or frequencies on a route. Um, also, reduce travel delays. BRT can benefit transit users by removing the bus from mixed traffic in congested areas and keep passengers moving. And lastly, shorter construction schedule for BRT. Construction is generally limited to the location of the station, uh, with most of the improvements being intersection signal work and street signage and striping. Thanks, Sarah. So we have a question that um, has come through the, the Q&A. Um, the question is, good evening. I live close to the light rail station on 19th Avenue and Northern. Crime in the area has increased exponentially since the light rail came into existence. Will the BRT further contribute to crime? And how is the city addressing this issue? Sure, so, uh, thanks, thanks for the question. Um, in general, when we uh, plan, uh, design, construct, and ultimately operate transit projects, we really wanna uh, focus on basically crime prevention through environmental design. So everything we do with the system, we wanna do so being um, cognizant of its potential impact to um, the areas surrounding the areas around it. We also wanna uh, focus on the experience of the rider themselves. And so there definitely are some uh, best practices. Um, but in terms of the actual specific elements, a lot of those won't be determined until the three corridors are identified. So once we identify our BRT foundation network and those three corridors, we'll then move into what's called the detailed corridor planning phase. And it would be at that, at that time that we would then focus in on, you know, for example, where are the station locations specifically? You know, what is the scale of these uh, state stations, you know, what are the elements in terms of safety and security? You know, do they have closed circuit TV cameras? I mean, what other features do they have? All those things will be incorporated during the corridor planning, and there will be a detailed public outreach process that accompanies that. So when we get to that that part of it, we would welcome your uh, feedback specifically. Thank you for that question. Just a reminder, you can raise your hand um, using WebEx or you can use the Q&A function. If you're joining via phone, just press star three and that will raise your hand. Any other questions, Christy? No, we do not have any questions at this time. Okay, comments, you can provide comments anytime, phoenix.gov slash BRT. And let's go back to um, some of our FAQs how will BRT accommodate different abilities? You can answer that one, Terry. So BRT provides improved accessibility for passengers of all abilities, including features such as level boarding, which we've mentioned, enhanced passenger amenities at stations, uh, more doors on the buses. We've mentioned uh, more than likely three doors on the bus for better entry and exit, and also more room for circulation within the bus itself. Great, thank you, Sarah. Any other questions? Do we have anything, Christy? I don't see any additional questions at this time. Okay. Your, your presentation, Sarah and Matthew, was very comprehensive. I'll throw one more question out there. Let's talk a little bit about, um, since we were talking about accommodating different abilities, how will BRT accommodate the cycling community? Yeah, I can uh, answer this one. Um, so uh, in general, BRT, uh, they have the ability to accommodate uh, bicycles in two places, either on the front of the bus or inside the bus. The trend kind of nationally is to move towards allowing uh, users to bring bicycles on the bus. And there are a couple of different ways that that's accommodated. Typically, they have uh, vertical hangers that are kind of similar to uh, what's on light rail. 
uh, today. And so that would be the predominant way that we would um, accommodate um, uh, bicycles on, on board of vehicles. But one of the uh, really important things is how do we um, connect um, our BRT network with the rest of the uh, bicycling network in the city of Phoenix. And there are some things that we've looked at, you know, in a lot of these uh, BRT corridors, you know, they cross the Arizona Canal or, you know, other locations that have a lot of uh, cycling usage. There's also a lot of um, corridors that are maybe the one mile arterial per se, but uh, do have um, like a high cycling number of cyclists on it. So an example would be like 15th Avenue. So any of our east west uh, uh, corridors could connect with, um, you know, basically a cycling route on 15th Avenue. So again, the actual details of that are going to really depend on what our uh, three quarters are selected as part of the foundation network, but it is a core component of our planning effort. Great, thank you, Matthew. I don't see any new questions in the Q&A. Chrissy, do you have any um, through the phone? Nope, no additional questions. Okay, um, maybe Sarah, if you could describe um, how BRT is funded. All right, so BRT is funded through the voter approved T 2050, the transportation 2050, as we've talked about earlier. And then eventually when, uh, when we get to the implementation of the BRT, we will have a discussion about uh, pursuing federal funds or utilizing local funds. And that will again, be a future discussion we will have. Great, thanks, Sarah. No additional questions coming through. Chrissy, do you see any in the uh, hand raised? No, no additional hand raised questions. Okay. Well, we thank everybody for joining us. Um, your input is very important. We certainly appreciate you taking the time to learn more about the program and to provide your feedback. Again, a recording will be available and posted to the webpage, phoenix.gov slash BRT. That's also where you can continue to view information. You can take a survey about the program. Um, if you don't have computer access, if you're calling in, if you need a hard copy of the survey, just contact us. Um, you can reach us at 602-256-3531 or TTY711. As a reminder, survey responses are being accepted through December 18th on the webpage. And thank you again for joining us. We very much appreciate it. Go to visit the webpage and have a great night. Thank you.